Does this work? All good? For the camera, so talk with your voice to the room. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Melana Pettering. How much time do I actually have? Uh, uh, like you are on for 55 minutes. 50? Wow, you that's good. Oh, excellent. So uh, just to um, uh, make this clear, if you have any questions, let's do that right away. Let's not wait until the end so that we can get a conversation happening here. I'm much more interested in like, uh, leading the discussion into the po uh, direction that you wanted and much less into me actually covering all my slides because I know that I have too many slides anyway. And it's really about the discussion, not about the slides. Anyway, so yeah. Um, today I'm talking about... Uh, uh, yeah, reinventing home directories. By the way, if any one of you has seen my talk about this very topic at uh, All Systems Go or at DEF CONF, it's going to be the same thing. There's a huge queue there. If you have seen it already, it would be good to just leave and let me do <laughs> You're not going to learn much new stuff. Anyway, but apparently no one has seen it before. Okay. So, yeah, what I'm going to talk about is Dollar Home, right, as you know it, or Tilda, as uh, you can even call it more uh, briefly. Um, yeah, what is actually Dollar Home? Dollar Home is obviously a directory, as you know, right? But it's, it's more than that. Like, you always, um, for something to be a home directory, you also need a matching entry in Etsy PassWD, actually in, in Etsy Shadow, and these kind of things. So it's currently, yeah, two things. Like, it's a user account in, in uh, Etsy PassWD, and it's actually a home directory in Slash Home. There are many problems that I have always seen with this idea. First of all, it needs a writable Etsy, right? And where writable Etsy, by that I mean that if you create a user, Etsy needs to be writable. I personally think we should go towards systems where Etsy is generally not writable, except if actually um, a reconfiguration takes place. And I would claim that creating users and, and things like that, changing users, is not a configuration change, but it's more like a, like a, like a, a payload change, right? It's what you do with the system itself, like, like what you do on the top of the system. It's not reconfiguration how the system itself behaves. So, yeah, I think that's kind of kind of weird mix right now in Etsy between the actual state, which is if a user exists or not to me, um, and the configuration of the system, uh, which is everything else that is t tends to be in Etsy. So um, another problem I always saw is that we ha always have to, on Unix, propagate the UAD assignments between systems. Um, if you have, like, uh, an NFS LDAP set up, it's like like madness to deal with that, right? Like, because the UAD range is relatively small, and hence uh, we need to be very, very careful if the system um, can show up in, in some environment that the UAD is matched, because that's how we do access control and everything's messy. Um, yeah, in the world of, uh, like, with LDAP and uh, with NIST before it and all these things, it's a major um, pain and with NFS to keep these UAD things in sync. I personally think, for most cases, how people use computers these days, right, like, for example, how I use my laptop, um, this is kind of weird, right, like, because we do all this infrastructure for uh, propagating, but I think we shouldn't, right, like, I think it would be way better if the UAD would actually be a, an artifact of the local system. That only makes sense by binding some user record to the local system when we actually come up with the UAD. That doesn't mean it has to be that way exclusively, it just means that I think we should go to that way where the UID is more the local artifact and not something global that we are supposed to propagate that actually isn't global because, of course, these fixed UID assignments don't work outside of specific organizations. Another big problem that I see is that there's no encryption built into this, right? Like, your home directory is generally not encrypted. You can have encryption on the, on the disk itself, like distributions tend to do full disk encryption or do encryption of slash home, but that's very distinct from the actual encryption of the home directory, which doesn't generally exist. And that is weird, because it has this, like, if you do full description, I, I, I tend to use that on my laptop, and most people probably here in the room also do the same thing. Um, you have this weird thing that during boot up, you actually query it for a password, and that's the password that matters, right? Like, that's the password that actually protects the data. But it's a system password, and what the fuck's the system password? It's something like on Unix, which was supposed to be a multi-user system, um, the sharing passwords between multiple people is a very weird concept, right? So, uh, yeah, and then after you typed in that password where that actually mattered, you got to view the authentication to GDM or, or, or your Getty or whatever you want to log into, where we ask for a username and a password. And this password doesn't matter much, right? Like, at that point, the data is all unlocked, right? Like, it's just about access control at that point um, anymore, not about actually protecting the data. And this is really weird, right? Like, first, the important one that is... Uh, like, on a multi-user system makes not much philosophical, like, conceptual sense. And then the per-user one 
which actually doesn't protect your data, which just does access control, and but it's the one that actually is inherently the, the multi-user stuff. So, yeah, this kind of weird... Um, um, yeah, to be precise, it's uh, no user controlled encryption. Yeah, that's no. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's system controlled encryption. Yeah. It's not user controlled encryption, and that is like I don't think we should do things this way, right? Like because uh, because yes, most of the time our laptops are like single user systems, um, but I think uh, still it should be. We should figure out how to encrypt the stuff, how to lock the stuff um, to the actual credentials you want to lock them to, right? Like the system, for example, should be locked to the TPM. <laughs> But your data should be locked to something that you control, your password, your YubiKey, or something like that. Yeah, so I call that mismatching encryption, right? The, it's, 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 you protect your data with it, but actually <coughs> what you protect the data with is a system property, not a user property. Um, there's also the problem no modern authentication mechanisms. By that, I mean, like, we live in a world now where YubiKeys become a thing, um, but everything is bound still to one single password in Etsy PassWD. Now, people have retrofitted YubiKeys into this, but it's always a little bit messy because it does not live in the actual user record. It's not part of Etsy PassWD, Etsy Shadow. It's part of something like a sidecar database, right? So um, the inherent user database uh, design of Unix is around passwords and nothing else, right? So, yeah, no modern authentic authentication mechanisms. And we live in a world now where we probably want even more than YubiKeys and passwords. We probably want pattern authentication, face unlocking, fingerprint stuff. I don't care. But... Uh, yeah, so we're kind of stuck in this world there, which is very weird. It's also not extensible, right? And this is this is big one actually, I think. Um, right now, struct past of UDs defines the same way as it was in 1985, right? It has these five fields: username, user ID, group ID, real name, home directory, and shell. Okay, that's six. Um, but it's uh, beyond that, you don't get anything, right? You, you can't add a field there. It, does, it doesn't exist. People have, of course, always wanted to extend this. And they did, right? Like Etsy Shadow is like the first attempt to extend this. So they added a, like an encrypted password, and they added some account meta information, like, uh, like uh, how long is an account valid and things like that. But it's, uh, yeah, and then you gain, uh, I call them sidecar databases because they are managed independently of Etsy Pass WD and carry additional information. These things get, get out of sync because, I mean, ad user, for example, doesn't care about, I don't know, the SSH key, for example, because the SSH key, like in your home directory, authorized keys file, that's a sidecar database, right? Like it's extending the user record in a way um, without actually having to get rid of the user record, right? So all these things, then they, they get out of sync, um, and they are messy. And uh, if you do resource limits, for example, you suddenly have a completely contra different configuration format, like pemrlimits.com for these things. So, uh, which is inherently user information, like how many how resources you actually want to give the user. But, yeah. Um, plant key side databases here. Etsy Shadows 1. Accounts demon is like this GNOME thing that uh, um, adds information about like a, like a photo to the user and, and a couple of other things. Um, that's like a, the perfect uh, sidecar database because it actually takes the Unix stuff and in a somewhat um, GNOME-specific way tries to add all kinds of newer shit to it. There's Samba, which maintains like a, a, a database um, for the CI, uh, SID, the SID, um, which is like how Windows does user management. Um, SSH has the SSH keys, PAM limits does resource limits and things like that. Um, and there's so much more than this. There's no resource management. Like the only resource management you get is PAM limits. But what they said, like resource management, I basically mean that, uh, yeah, if we actually have a multi-user system, right, um, you probably want to assign a set of resources to specific users, right? Like, because not use all users are equal, the, the administrator probably should get more memory in CPU <coughs> if, he, if he wants to, or if she wants to, um, than, the, than a regular user, right? So they're, they're in the classic model, there's no resource management built in. The only uh, resource management you get is PAM limits, and that's bullshit, quite frankly, because uh, that resource limit is per process, right? So you can fork... You get a new set of uh, resources fresh for free, and then nobody will uh, stop you from doing this. So how we actually want to do resource management these days is with C groups, the kind of stuff that system you manages. Um, and we have nothing so far. So these are the problems I always saw. Um, and it's kind of, yeah, if you start doing something like Home and you figure out what do you actually want to fix. This is the stuff <laughs> we want to fix. What we put the focus on is, um, uh, like, I mean, then you have to figure out what what's the focus actually, yeah, you want to... Uh, uh, um, like who you actually want to use this stuff. The focus for HomeD is human users, right? This is in, 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 in contrast to system users, like, uh, I don't know, the, the, the this user that your Apache daemon runs under or things like that. So for HomeD, I only care about human users. Like, 
me using that thing. Um, in particular, laptop users, right? Like, this is a world. On a laptop, you usually have one user. Maybe you have two users because your girlfriend uses it too or your boyfriend or whoever. Um, but uh, you, you're unlikely going to have 1,000 users on this one laptop, right? I mean, there are certainly environments which do that, but it's out of the scope for what I care about. So, um, yeah, the amount of users you have on your laptop is below 10. That's kind of the focus. Um, the goals that I... Uh, want to solve it the same way because I kind of like this. Is uh, one of them. I don't. I'm not sure how much um, how how interesting this particular facet of this in real life. But I kind of found it a sexy idea, which is truly migratable home directories, right? All the way to the point of having a home on a stick. By home on a stick, I mean basically that you have a USB stick, and that this not only is where you store your home directory, but it is your home directory. Meaning that you can plug it into this laptop today, log in and just works, and you can take it out and put in another laptop uh, tomorrow. Log in there, and it all just works, right? So um, for me, migratable home directories means you have the actual data, but you also have the 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 accounts information for that home record, all in one unified f uh, uh, place, so they can just take it from this system into another system, right? So again, this USB stick thing, nice uh, thing, and I'm pretty sure some security paranoid people will love this because it basically means. You never leave actual payload data on the system while you're logged out um, because you just have it in your pocket and take it to the other device, and only then you log in there. But uh, in general, like, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure, like, I personally wouldn't use this. Like, I, I want to store my data on my laptop because everything else is just, I don't know, I'm, I'm a lazy person. But it still is, is uh, kind of useful that if I get a new laptop, I can just take this one file, which is my home directory, and put it somewhere else, and it's all in there. I don't have to reallocate the same UID and assign Etsy past WD in there and don't have to populate all this other sidecar databases so it all matches again with my old laptop. So a, a very stupid security question. Mm -hmm. um, because we are bringing our home directory to some random machine, then how do we protect the uh, home directory if we connect it to some malicious machine that someone has a root account and can just copy the content of our uh, home directory, even though it was encrypted, but at the time when we logged in, it, it was decrypted. Uh, so I'm not sure if I understood the question, but uh, I'm supposed to repeat it. So the question was regarding uh, how is this protected, that if you co copy it to some rogue machine that... So if you take a pen drive from one laptop to, to another, another one, which is untrusted, okay. and has some malicious software, so as soon as you uh, log in and unlock the pen drive decrypted, so uh, um, the question is like, if you if you actually have your home directory on a on a pen drive and you move it from one machine to the other and you don't trust <laughs> the other one, uh, how do, does your data get prepared? It doesn't, right? The answer to this is, uh, I mean, don't do that to untrusted systems. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what do you think? Like, I mean, the point is really like, of course, you have to establish some level of trust between your home directory and the user, right? And we do this to some point. Like, we, for example, all the like what, when HomeD manages something, it signs the user records and makes sure that uh, um, you have to have a signed uh, a record that actually has a key in the key uh, ring that is on that specific system to do the other kind of uh, uh, protection. But inherently, you know, the USB stick cannot, like it's a passive storage, right? Like it cannot enforce security policies on its own because it's not a computer. It's a storage device, right? So um, if the host has access to your credentials so that it can unlock your USB storage, right? If you were dumb enough to provide your password to that user, then it's uh, freedom. Like, he, the, the system can do whatever it wants, right? But the key of, of uh, what I'm uh, trying to design here really is that you have very clear life cycles that you basically say, when you're logged out, you're logged out. When you're logged in, you're logged in, right? And while you're logged in, you will get, or the system will get access to the, to the device. But when you're logged out, it should not be possible to access your device, right? So that the moment where you decide to trust that machine, right, is the moment where you type in your password. And only then the machine can, can access it. And then you, when you pull it out, it loses the ability to do this. But yes, do not plug this into untrusted machines. If you do, you're dumb. I'm sorry. So yeah. <laughs> How, you know, how, how to convince the user and make sure that they are aware that even if they have all their data on the pen drive, they cannot go just to the library and connect it to some random PC because someone yep. has all I mean, my data and all my home directory. 
This talk is not about fixing the problem of untrusted computers, right? <laughs> I think we should uh, do this better, and there is like Chromebooks, for example, have a better model there, not a perfect model. But I'm uh, like, you know, you can never have an entirely secure system because um, sure we can lock things down in software, and we should. But also, um, I don't know, I'm not capable of detecting a key logger on my machine, like a physical one, right? So um, I don't know. Yeah, if you don't trust the machine, don't use it. But what I'm trying to get to here, right, is at least that that it is very clearly defined, like, when data access is allowed and when it stops, right? So that, yeah, the only thing that the user has to do is, like, provide the password to the system, and, and that actually and truly unlocks access to it. So, yeah. Anyway, let's... 80% of your problems are solved with using ZFS already. So why you never looked at it? For home directories, encryption, I'm sorry. snapshot is there. <laughs> 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 so then you can move to ARM, to, to Spark, to, to other architectures. So yeah, I don't think that ZFS solves any of these problems. Like, first of all, like, uh, again, home directories for me is uh, something that's uh, self-describing, right? Like, so you have the data store <laughs> and you have the user uh, uh, record metadata. I don't think that ZFS does that. ZFS is a user manager that has like a user database in it. Again, that's not what I'm saying. I, anyway, let's have the discussion otherwise. I think this is um, um, uh, like this is about user management. ZFS is not a user management daemon. It's a file system, and I'm not sure I have to have the discussion here about what the difference between a file system and a user manager is. So I'm sorry, but let's discuss it afterwards. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a general problem that uh, configuration files are, are not always as stable as we wish them to be, but no, that's not, not in focus for this stuff. I mean, it's like, yeah, if, if apps break like this, um, it's nasty, but I think, you know, um, it's for the apps to fix. And it's, it's, I don't think, I mean, the, the big thing that tends to break is usually the downgrades, <laughs> not the upgrades, right? Like, because app, app developers have an interest that the stuff just continues to work as people update the stuff. But I think... The problem becomes less of a problem as soon as we move to a model where software is always updated because we have to move to that model for security reasons, right? And then this kind of solved as a side effect, yeah, I think. Most of the problem if you're going from a rolling release to store and have your stable release at work. And yeah, but it, um, it's kind of, you know, this is, this is not a problem that is new to this model, right? It's a problem that you always had to deal with at NFS and these kind of things, right? But, uh, yes, you are expected to run the newest stuff in a world where we have security problems. And, uh, yeah. Um, anyway, let's go on with the slides for a moment. Um, so, yeah, the uh, home directories shall be self-contained, right? Like, the data shall not be distributed uh, over the entire system. There shouldn't be an Etsy pass W entry, Etsy shadow entry, and all the sidecar database. It should just be monopolized in one place. Um, and that also means that the mere existence of the file home, foobar.home, synthesizes the user record, right? So you drop it in there, and that's a sufficient so that get and pass wd, like this, this uh, uh, um, uh, Unix tool that allows you to, or Linux tool that allows you to enumerate all users, makes up, ma make sure that the user shows up, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, in a way, it's the most Unixy thing you can do. Everything's a file, right? Like, and suddenly the user becomes a file in, in, in this self-contained. Um, uh, I kind of men mentioned this already that I want that UAD ass assignments become a local artifact, right? Like so that uh, at the moment where you log in, the UAD gets assigned um, and it's uh, valid for this local system. But when you move the home directory to another system, then ideally you get the same UAD, but it actually doesn't really matter if it's taken there already. You get a different one, and we deal with this uh, nicely. So yeah, UIDs become local artifacts. It doesn't mean they have to become that. If you actually want to have a fixed one, lock yourself out. It's all supported. But uh, uh, at least it should be supported and it should be the default of behavior that people don't have to think about synchronizing UIDs across the entire organization. Uh, this is kind of core of uh, one of the ideas, that the uni that unification between user password and encryption key. I kind of already indicated that earlier, um, that we have this current weird split where you have the password for the full disk encryption, which is actually the encryption key, and then you have the user password, which is a distinct concept. Um, I think this is, this is wrong. should be the same thing. If I can uh, encrypt, uh, decrypt uh, a home directory, this is the same thing to me as authentication. And uh, authentication should always uh, be the ability to decrypt the home directory so uh, that things actually are unified and people can actually understand this. Also, extensible user records, right? I talked so much about the sidecar database and how awful they are. Extensible user records basically mean that anyone can put anything in these user records. I don't have to care 
um, we don't have to, to have a, like a set in stone set of fields, but uh, the Samba people can, as I said, the, I don't know, Kerberos people can put their stuff in there, and whoever wants to put more stuff can do this. It should be truly extensible, and everybody can have their own fields, depending on whoever they want to manage. Uh, also, one important thing is, like, we live in a world these days where full descript encryption is used, but also in a world where people don't turn off their computers anymore. I don't. Like, I, I checked the uptime yesterday. It's like 50 days. I have not turned off my computer anymore. So um, the way how full descript encryption works um, so far is always that, uh, yeah, during boot, you supply the password. And then it stays in memory all the 50 days that I've been using this computer. Right? Like, so if you manage to steal my laptop and manage to access my memory, which is not as hard as uh, you might think, um, uh, you'll find my 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 decryption keys in memory and can then decrypt all my data. And that sucks, right? So what should we do? We should make sure that when you suspend the machine, this stuff is erased from memory first, right? So that if somebody steals my laptop while it's suspended, they still will not be able to access um, uh, my laptop. It's really like as if you had a house and you would just put the key um, next to the door so that whoever wants to break in can just take the key and break in, right? So uh, um, fixing this... Like, Lux always had a concept of suspending access and just erasing the key so that this all works. But it was always extremely hard to implement in real life because if you do full disencryption, the OS itself sits on the encrypted medium, right? So um, if you want to re-request the password from the user when the system comes back from resume, you need to ask the user for something, but it cannot be the, this OS itself because the OS itself sits on the encrypted medium, right? And that basically means that, yeah, if something's not paged in, um, you need to read from a hard disk you cannot read from because you haven't supplied the password yet, but you are the one who is supposed to ask for the password, so you deadlock and everything shit. So uh, uh, we need to come to a world where we can do this safely, meaning that the infrastructure that asks for the password needs to be separate from the stuff that we actually lock down where we flush out all the keys. Um, also what is important to me is like... Uh, uh, it's not all passwords anymore, right? Like, in particular, I'm interested in, in, in PKCS11 devices, like YubiKey specifically, but also any kind of other device, where um, we actually truly use them properly, right? Not for authentication, <coughs> and not just for authentication, but also for the encryption part, right? So that we use them as the smart cards that they are, and actually derive the encryption keys for the for the Lux medium directly from the YubiKeys the correct way. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of key that, yeah, I, I don't know. I want to be able to use... YubiKeys at least, and actually not just use them for, I don't know, authentication of authenticating to Google. I actually <laughs> want to use them to properly and securely protect my local system. So, there are a couple of complications with this. SSH logins um, is one of them. Like, the problem is always, like, if we lock this down properly, so that uh, unless you have provided your password, there's, it's impossible to access your data, you lose SSH logins to some point, right? And because SSH, you know how it works, right? Like, it reads the... the um, the, 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 um, uh, as a, the authorized <coughs> keys file from your home directory. So before you logged in, how is it supposed to do that if the home directory is encrypted and you only have, can decrypt it after you authenticate it? That thing is solvable, and we solve it to some point um, because we're actually able to, to, to embed the, the authorized key stuff into the user record, which is available before you actually mount it. But then you still have the problem uh, somewhere, if you log in for the first time, the, the password needs to be supplied, right? Like uh, uh, in... Authentication via SSH keys, like how people use SSH, be means basically there's never a password actually exchanged, but we need that password to unlock the disk. In an ideal world, we could just fix it so that uh, when you log in, first SSH does its own authentication, and we would then simply ask the user, hey, please provide the actual password so I can decrypt the hard disk for you. Fortunately, the way SSH and PAM and these things work, we can't really do this. It's not a big problem. I know in the, in the previous times I did this talk, people really, really uh, uh, hung themselves up on this issue. I don't think it's much of a big problem. Like, first of all, it's about laptops. It's the stuff you log in with SSH, uh, uh, with SSH out of. It's not the stuff you typically log in. If you do, you do it for emergency purposes, and I can live with that to some point. Also, you can always do this thing where you log into some other account that doesn't have these kind of protections, and then locally provide the password to unlock it, like there's a command for that, and just log out and then log in really, because as soon as it's unlocked once, you, the SSH works as it always worked, because then the password is applied, and then the home directory is mounted, and everything's good. Um, Are not part of the uh, user record or anything, which means that they reside in plain text on the pen drive, right? No. No? Okay. 
Um, so uh, the question was regarding uh, what about these SSH authorized keys? If they are part of the user record, do they reside unencrypted on the pen drive? No, they don't. Like if you actually, again, don't hang yourself up on the pen drive. I made that as an example, but I don't want you to think that home, D is about home directories and pen drives. You can do that, but let's forget about the pen drive thing. But uh, no, we of course made sure that this doesn't happen. So the user record is actually stored three times um, uh, per pen drive or loopback file. Um, once inside of the home directory, which is encrypted. Once uh, uh, in an encrypted form in the Lux header, which is entirely redundant. The only reason we do this is, is mostly because the kernel file system people made very clear that they are not interested in making sure that uh, images, OS, like, like file system images that you have that are rogue, cannot exploit the kernel when you mount them. Right? Like there is no fuzzing and these things taking place so that you can have rogue file systems and the kernel doesn't fuck up if, if it actually <laughs> access them. So that basically means we always need to establish trust first, to some point at least, before we mount it. Right? And the way we do this is by decrypting first that uh, user record that is on the USB stick, uh, verifying that it's properly signed, that it's a user record that's actually supposed to log in, and only then we go into mounting. So that is a minimal uh, level of authentication is established. But anyway, this user record is encrypted like the first one. And then there's a third one, which is actually copied onto the host the first time you log in, right? Because we still have to pin your user ID so that every time you come back, you get the same user ID. That's important because the way Unix works, if you have a file in some writable directory somewhere, um, we cannot recycle the UID right now. It's something we will also want to fix with sandboxing, but it's a separate <laughs> story independent of this one. But anyway, so yeah, you basically end up with three copies. A two on the stick, one on the system. Um, and uh, yeah, it, we carefully made sure that when uh, you lose your USB stick on the street, somebody else picks it up, that the only information that is actually leaked um, to that user is your username, right? Like, because we need that, because if we stick it in, then you have to still type something into your Getty prompt or something, um, uh, and then provide the password. And the password is, when you provide that for the first time, is actually the thing that unlocks um, the user record. Because again, uh, as talked for, for uh, earlier, we need to define clearly the point in time where this trust is established, where you provide the password to tell the system, it's okay now, you may have access, I trust you. Um, disk space assignments. So uh, with HomeD, like, uh, the, the way I, uh, like, uh, HomeD is actually something that has five different backends. Um, the backend that I try to push people towards is the Lux backend, where you basically either have your USB stick or you have a loopback file in slash home, where everything is, is, is stored internally. Um, but there are actually a couple of other um, backends, like there's one for FScript, which is like XD4 online, like, like the, the encryption that is above the file system layer. Um, there is also a couple of others, uh, like plain directories, even if you don't care about encryption. But uh, yeah, the one that I actually think that people should be using is the Lux one, because it has the strongest security um, uh, uh, properties and allows you to do these things, like raising the keys from memory when you suspend and more things. But it comes at, a, at an interesting behavior, which is disk space assignment. If we have a loopback file for every user in slash home, then it basically means, uh, yeah, this disk, like how, how you size that loopback file basically means how much data that user can store, right? Traditionally on Unix, um, we always said that, uh, yeah, on my laptop, if I have five users, all of them can fill up slash home as they want. Uh, they all fight for the viable disk space. Um, and the one who is lucky is lucky, and the one who isn't lucky is not lucky, right? With uh, disk space sound and with loopback files, you, of course, have to size the stuff a priori. We can resize online all the time. That's great. That, that's exposed in HomeD. But you still have to, yeah, you basically get committed uh, disk space assignments. And uh, if you think about it in a simple way, they cannot overlap. Right, so that basically you lose the overcommit functionality that <coughs> how uh, user management traditionally worked, where you basically would say, yeah, um, even if you use U quota, you could say, I have a one gigabyte disk, but I give everybody two gigabytes of it, which made no sense, but you could do this and was kind of how, how we did this thing. Right, so I don't think that's much of a problem because we have these nice behaviors in, in Home D where you can do stuff like, you know, sparse files and discard. Um, like on Unix, we have this concept of sparse files where basically if you have a large uh, uh, file and it has zeros in it, you don't actually have to <laughs> allocate space for these zeros, but you can just let the file system deal with it and tell it that this is empty space. You're not supposed to store it. Just when I read it, give me empty space, uh, like zeros back. So, um, and uh, we can use it all across the stack, like that the loopback uh, device does that and the file system dev uh, device does that. And in HomeD, we have this um, automatism that when you log in, we actually F allocate stuff for you so that actually this white space is removed. That basically means that while you're logged in, you get these guarantees that the 
one gigabyte you got assigned is actually um, what you get assigned. Well, when you log out, we uh, tell basically the kernel to remove all the holes again, um, return it basically to the underlying fi file system so that somebody else who then logs in um, can use them. Um, the effect of this is, um, yeah, we get give you guarantees that when you log in and you are assigned one gigabyte, you get the one gigabyte and nobody can take that away from you. If you're logged out, so everything is shrunk to the actual sp space that you need. Um, and uh, other people can use its space. So, uh, yes, this space assignment becomes uh, a little bit more complex, but it's actually, I think, very much, very nicely manageable um, as long as you don't assume that you want multiple users to use your laptop at the same time. I'm not sure how that even would work because I only have one screen, one keyboard, but sure. So, yeah. There's also the problem of UID assignments. Um, and it sucks a bit. Like, because, as I mentioned, I want that the UIDs become an uh, artifact of the local system. And if they become artifact of the local system, we have to pick a UID at the first login and assign it to that user um, that is not used on that specific system yet. But that is sucks because then all the files in the home directory will be owned by wh wherever this stuff was mounted earlier where it got a possibly different UID. <laughs> what do we deal with this? Ideally, we would just tell the kernel, mount this stuff and make all files owned by this UID. Unfortunately, the kernel currently does, uh, doesn't have that. Hopefully, eventually it does. So what do we do? We do recursive chunk. Meaning that, like, when you log in and the U doesn't matter, we just actually go to the file system and churn all the files. Sucks. Doesn't suck as much as you might think because actually churning recursively on modern file systems is ridiculously fast. They're optimized for this kind of thing that dentry lookups are cheap. And uh, uh, so it's not as slow as you might think. Like, at least on my home directory with, um, I don't know, 500 gigabytes or something or no more, it takes like two seconds if the UAD uh, actually changes. Uh, yeah, this comes up all the time. Um, uh, we can use user namespace for that, but actually I don't think we want to. User namespace basically means that you have to have a sandbox around the user because he has to live in that or she has to live in that um, in that namespace. But that sucks because uh, if you, as soon as you do sandboxing, you basically lose privileges on the system. You live in your own little world. Um, people have done this before, like particularly for file system namespace, and I'm pretty sure we should go that way eventually. But it also means that... Yeah, weird things happen because if you do these kind of mountain namespaces, then you see the system in a completely different way than uh, you would traditionally do. With HomeD, I didn't want to go to that step yet, right? Like, I think we should have sandboxing, but also this is inherently supposed to be something that I want to use on my laptop, right? And if my user can't see the system anymore the way it is, then I'm going to have a very hard time with debugging that stuff. But you're absolutely right. Eventually, we should have sandboxing. And um, I don't know, if I built a laptop like this and give that to my mother, she has no need to see all the processes owned by the correct users. So uh, for her, we definitely want the sandboxing to just work. Um, yeah, lux locking. I've already talked about this, like about the stuff that. Uh, yeah, I mean, so uh, 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 as mentioned, um, HomeD does this thing where, when you suspend the system, all the crypto keys that are actually used for for lux stuff is removed from memory. But then we have the problem uh, uh, that when the system comes back again, we have to provide the passwords again so that you can actually ho use your home directory. The way we address this right now is we don't. <laughs> the uh, the, um, we have this requirement, basically, that after you come back from resume, um, there's some kind of authentication taking place where we can read um, the password again from the user and use it to unlock stuff. Uh, the way I think of this would, should work in the end is that, if you, for example, if you use GNOME, that uh, right, right now you get, when the system resumes again, you get this lock screen where you're supposed to re-authenticate, <laughs> but this password is always stays with a GNOME, and I think it's... Yeah, and it runs like this password prompt runs under the user ID of the user itself, which I think is problematic anyway. But uh, that, that, that approach doesn't really work anymore because, after all, if we come back from the resume, everything that the, is in the home directory and that accesses the home directory is going to be suspended because we removed the key so that it can't actually read or write from that home directory. So what we do need to do there is that instead of... Uh, doing the screen lock from the user's own session, we need to switch back to GDM or something, so to the display manager, to some privileged component that asks for username and password. And then um, when, that, when you provide the password, we can use it to unlock everything, and then you can switch back. So this is a little bit of a, of a, of a complication, but if you talk to the GNOME people, I think they're very much on board with making this work. Um, as long as we don't have that, you can even just do switch to a Getty, do a quick login, log out again. And what kind of design of the plain media where you're locked to? Sorry? Like playing media where you're locked to access to some data you want. Like, for example, in G in Long Shell it gives the ability to control your media where you're locked and you want to continue to do that. 
um, like media playing, like media like 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 you mean music playing. Oh, well, I mean it's it's like this stuff is supposed to be secure, right? Like that, so that you get this guarantee that when you're not sitting in front of the computer and have provided um, the password um, when you started using it, that nothing can access your home directory, right? Like this is a security guarantee that I want to give you because I think it's a good security uh, um, guarantee. This does conflict if people want to do stuff with, for example, that. Um, I don't know, you get email notifications when you're not logged in and, and, and things like that, or that, that you can play music while you're not logged in. But, uh, yeah, it, that is fine even, right? Like, in that case, don't suspend the machine. I mean, you wouldn't suspend the machine anyway, would you? I like, I mean, because then the music would stop playing, too. So... Yeah, I want to expand on that. Like, I'm sending a big file to a server, waiting two hours. I'm going away because I need some coffee. I'm not going to sit. I'm going to log out. Well, then, I'm losing access. Um, my download is not continuing? Uh, not yes. I mean, I will give you the guarantee. So the question was regarding what happens if I do a long uh, term, uh, like, like a long download. And uh, um, uh, you, you traditionally, um, this person here solved it, like logging actually out and making sure that the download continues in the background. What does happen if this is used? Yeah, I give you the guarantee when you're not in front of the computer, your data is not accessed by the system, right? And this basically means the conflicts with that stuff. But, you know, um, you can, like... Uh, this is like, you know, this lingering concept of login D? Um, it basically allows you to say, uh, yeah, leave this stuff around from this user when you're locked, locked, locked out. You can just turn this on, but that basically means you lose this nice property because that means the crypto keys need to stay in memory as long as your stuff uh, logs out, even if you're not sitting in front of the, of, the, of the computer. So, yes, you can do this. I don't think that it's nice semantics, though, right? I'm pretty sure that, at least on my laptop, I want to know that when I leave this stuff, that I know that nothing there can access my memory, that, I don't know, everybody can steal my laptop and still not get access to my memory. This is a much nicer property that I want to deliver to people than, than uh, yeah, being able to download, uh, finish downloads while I'm not logged in. So, yeah, I mean, this is conflicting stuff, right? I know, like, for, I mean, we take away to some point cron jobs for you as well, right? Like, because cron jobs traditionally have this thing where uh, they would run even when you're not locked, locked in, right? Uh, in this model, it doesn't work, right? Like, if you run stuff as unprivileged user while you're not locked in, somebody has to provide the password. And if you don't, because you had less cron job, um, then no way. You don't get to go do this, right? But this is entirely up to you. You know, if you subscribe into this model, like actually using HomeD and getting these security in, uh, ideas, you lose the property of being able to use your home directory with authentication. But then, if that is important to you, you probably shouldn't use HomeD. Or, um, uh, uh, like, I mean, there's something we can probably do is that um, if you turn on this lingering thing that I mentioned, right, and that basically also means that we can basically set up the user context during boot instead of uh, during login, right? So we could actually say, if you set up things like that, and we need the password to, to actually work, that we ask you during boot, like we always did full full encryption for the password, so you lock at once at that point. But this is not implemented. This is something that's relatively easy to do, but we don't do, do that right now. But uh, um, I don't know. It's kind of outside of the model I want to go to, right? I wanted this lockdown, secure thing, and that is like for me means that if I'm not at my laptop, nobody, nothing should get access to my data. Um, how much time do you actually still have? Seventeen minutes. Um, so actual implementation. I talked a lot about the stuff that I want to do with this. Um, now let's actually talk about how this translates to code in systemd. There's uh, we added two concepts, and all the last stuff was actually uh, merged two days ago. One is JSON user records. Um, JSON user records, like, with all the stuff I talked about, locks and the actual HomeD stuff, is kind of independent of this. Like, the first thing I want to deliver is JSON user records. So basically, that, uh, yeah, a struct past WD, you can have that in JSON now, and it's fully extensible. And uh, um, you can denote lots and lots of different properties. And systemd, if you provide these JSON user records, will actually do resource management for you, a couple of security things for you, a couple of, of uh, like, actually run other runtime parameters for you. Um, uh, but we can agree on some form of uh, more modern um, way of talking about users. These JSON user records are not bound to HomeD. Like, HomeD is one component that then makes use of this, but actually anyone can supply, like, anyone who's privileged on your system can provide additional uh, JSON user records. Um, and I, like, like uh, we just had this conference, this DEF CONF conference in, in Czech Republic, like, where I talked to all the rat hat people who do uh, LDAP and these things, and we're mostly on the same page that, 
Yeah, they're going to be able, they're going to supply from SSSD and this LDAP stuff user, user records in the same format so that for the first time they can, from the LDAP database, um, actually do you proper user management, security management, that all the way proper guides done to the system and system D enforces it. So, uh, yeah, this is concept A. It was mentioned independent of Home D. You don't have to buy into Home D to make, be able to make use of this. Um, it's a super set of NSS records, so it's struct past WD and struct group, and actually all the shadow ones, and extensible. Um, there's a Varlink interface. Varlink is some IPC system to, uh, to query this, and it's extremely dumb and simple. Um, and the idea basically is that anyone, like any component that wants to provide a uh, local user can just um, implement that Varlink interface once, and then uh, clients can just ask them all at the same time and uh, I'll query those users. It's convertible forth and back to an NSS, lossy of course, because NSS records, like by NSS records I mean like struct past and struct group, because they of course don't have all the metadata. But uh, systemd will uh, do all the conversion for you, so you, it's up to you if you just want to supply the classic NSS stuff, like most components currently do, then we'll generate JSON stuff on the fly. But the other way we'll also do it, like if you only put, supply the JSON stuff, then we'll generate NSS stuff for you if you want that. Uh, how does it actually look like? Here's an example, it's kind of complicated. Uh, some things are pretty obvious, like username, like this user is called Groby, and I don't know, nice level means that when the user logs in, he gets a, a, a nice level of five. Um, uh, this member of is about groups, that this user is supposed to be a, group, a member of the group wheel. Last change user, I guess I don't have to explain what that probably means. There's a concept of, uh, yeah, uh, of certain subsections, like binding, which is, like the binding one is actually the one that um, maps a user record onto the local system. Right, like because a user record is something that I think should be independent of this, uh, the, the local system, but some of its fields inherently, like for example the user ID, like this one here, actually inherently have to have a local concept if we want to do this thing where we say that UIDs should be a local artifact. So a binding is supposed to manage this. Binding is basically, yeah, uh, this is the machine ID of the specific system, and then you store a couple of metadata that is specific on that speci uh, system to it. I don't want to go into in too much detail about this, uh, this specification up. It's, if you want to know all this, uh, just uh, to see that, like, privilege is basically where the hash password is. is it's like Etsy Shadow. Um, we put that in a separate section so that we can hide it from clients if they shall not have access. Their signature, uh, which is like the cryptographic signature that I mentioned, um, how you can make sure that, um, that uh, yeah, on a specific system only, for example, users signed by the Rat Hat key can log in and other systems not. Do the usernames have to be unique? Very good question. So the question was uh, regarding if usernames have to be unique on specific systems. Yes, they do, because Unix works that way. Um, but that basically, like, so I added a concept called a realm there. It's a little bit more like a Kerberos dom uh, realm, but it's also like domain. I didn't want to define that any further. But the idea basically is that I can have user Leonard at redhat.com and uh, can distinguish it from a user Leonard at, I don't know, um, Berlin, the EU, or something like this, um, because they have a different suffix. But once you log in on that specific system, only one user Leonard can exist. Right. So it's a bit nasty that this is how Unix works and we can't really fix that. Um, but uh, I think it's probably in real life not that bad because on my laptop I'm probably not going to have multiple Leonards that are actually different. Uh, um, so that was the first thing, user records and JSON. Second thing is concept B. That's actually the home B part about it. So we have encrypted locks home directories and loopback files, the stuff that I was talking about so, so long. Um, I mentioned that we have one file per user, like slash home foobar.home is a loopback file, a gigabyte in size. Inside of that, you have a lock stuff. You can actually mount that thing just with regular tools like you always did because it's just that, right? Like it's not the reinvention of stuff. It's just uh, using stuff we already have and augmenting it slightly bit so that it's useful for user records. Um, and uh, yeah, if you mount it, you find the, the, the <laughs> JSON record, like the actual user record inside of uh, identity there. But yeah, it's managed by the new service called SystemD Homebe. You can uh, accept this and use it, or you don't have to. It's like entirely one provider of that user DB stuff, but it's just one provider. If you don't want to use it, don't use it, right? Like there can be others. Like, for example, if you're really, really bought into the LDAP concept that you have everything centralized and machines kind of part of, a, of an organization, if you so will, then you can uh, soon, hopefully, um, use the user DB stuff, but not use HomeD. Like HomeD is really about the use case where you have relatively migratable, um, independent little laptops. Um, I have a user uh, directory here, and I can migrate it to another one, and it all just works. Yeah, concept A, user DB records, is independent of concept B in one way. Right? Like you can use A without B, but B implies A. Um, 
Yeah, integration with the West, a couple of other components, but uh, I don't want to go into much detail here unless you have no further questions, because I think we have only 10 minutes left or something. So let's focus on questions. Sorry, what do you mean? I don't get it. Um, so as I understand, uh, Home B discourages or even prohibits to just lock the screen, but do not log out. So no, it doesn't. Huh? No. Can you repeat the question? So the question was regarding if, uh, 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 as he understood it, Home D prohibits locking the screen without actually logging out. But that's not true. No. Oh, okay. so just screen locking is screen locking. But screen locking means, to me, that's the keys are, le uh, are left over there. Like, you can, if you want to, turn this into something where you say, basically, screen lock also means we flush out the keys. That basically means, yes, everything stops running. But uh, we, we are not there yet. This is something we can think about. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you want this. But it, if, if we do with this, then it should be an option. But no, this does not imply this. This is something to think about that we might do later. But no, no implication there. So you said that the idea is uh, that you can migrate your home directory for home machine. What is the frequency you plan to do that? Is that a fair <coughs> option? It just works. Uh, I personally work all the, every day with two computers, and I would like to, pe uh, to carry a pen drive. Is that something that is just done in a minute that I can somehow do that? Uh, and if there are several versions of that thing, that when you need backups, how do you do the versioning? And what happens if I start to use an older version and then I go to the old one? Okay, so the question was regarding synchronization, right? Like if you have uh, multiple users, um, and I know you have the same user on multiple machines, like um, how do we solve this? We don't. Right, so this is not a synchronization tool, right? Like, um, I think having a synchronization tool would be extremely interesting, but it's, uh, and I think this can actually be really nice because, like, I mean, as soon as you have your home directory in, uh, in, uh, in one unified file, you can do stuff like actually distributing it to other systems in encrypted fashion without actually the distributing thing actually knowing what it actually distributes there. You can do backups even, like, because you can do ref link, like, because it's one file, you just do a CP with a ref link, you pay for nothing, you have a backup of that day and things like that. Um, so I think the synchronization problem is a very interesting one, and we should look into this eventually. But this one is not going to solve this. And uh, in particular, it's not going to deal with deltas for you, right? Like with diffs between uh, what you did on this laptop and what you dis uh, did on this laptop, because that is inherently something that needs to live above. Um, uh, like if you actually want to do proper diffs uh, above the file system, above the encryption, because, I mean, doing diffs on encrypted stuff isn't really possible. So I think a very interesting problem, not, not, not going to be solved by this, but I think it enables some things that we can make distributed stuff like this work. Like, for example, that, I don't know, if you are connected with a network that we just um, uh, uh, make sure that you're only lo locked in once uh, uh, everywhere, and then whenever you log into something that your stuff migrates somewhere. I mean, you can even do stuff like, for example, you can have your home directory on an iSCSI volume or NBD volume or something like this, which is available to onto your entire network, right? Because this stuff is just a fucking block device. Um, it basically means that, yeah, if it's just there, it's going to pop up as a user, um, and then you look in any machine you like, and you know that it's always shared because you always write to the same thing. We have no infrastructure for locking in this case, so don't actually do this. But it's uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's certainly an idea. Like it opens a lot of doors where you can 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 do stuff like that. Um, but yeah, thinking is not solved right now. But I think it's very like the other problem with thinking is like people disagree what they actually want to have synced. Some people want just the configuration. Some people want the entire home directory. I have no nice answer like uh, uh, to this. Um, the GNOME people have been looking into doing some syncing stuff. Um, I don't know where this goes. Um, but yeah, we have to figure that out. Uh, I have a question about uh, groups and packets. If there are two laptops with different groups with the same name, uh, with your first design, you, are, you can define a user with some groups. But if you use the common groups, but with different words, what's happened? With, with different what? With different? You can have the same groups, but on both systems could be different lines. So, uh, so, uh, um, so the question was regarding uh, um, uh, what happens if uh, groups are defined differently on multiple systems, but you have one user that is accessing both of these systems. So first of all, uh, you know, the, you saw the JSON stuff, right? Like there's actually one se a section in there that's called per machine. 
where you can have uh, static data that you configure, and then you can configure different, like from of some of these settings, you can define per machine settings. So, so you could basically say, yeah, if on this laptop um, uh, the group FUBAR is something completely conceptually different than the same named group FUBAR on some other system, then you can basically say, yeah, on this one, I want to be a member of that. On that one, I don't, right? So first of all, that's one thing. Ultimately, the rule, though, is... Um, we allow access to anyone who has a user record that is signed by some key that is recognized by the local system, right? The entity that signs that really needs to take care of this problem, right? So I'm not going to solve this problem that if you have uh, equally named stuff on different systems um, uh, uh, for you, that's the person who puts together the user record for you um, who needs to deal with these problems and then maybe create per machine stuff or do something else um, so that this problem is fixed. Well, I mean, uh, we don't, I'm, not a, like, I'm not a standards organization. So what's the state of the standard for the uh, JSON user records? I'm not a standards organization. I mean, I kind of am, but also I'm not. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, let me show you. Uh, yeah, there's lots of interesting stuff in the slides, by the way. Uh, that's where the standard is. So uh, uh, if you go to... Uh, if you go to uh, this one, this is where the, the, the current adjacent stuff is documented for the users, this is for the groups. This is for the Valing API to query it, um, and this is what we, it, it documents what we do if we use the Lux uh, home directory stuff, if you use that backend. Um, yeah, all of this is extensible, right? And it's, it's extensible in that fashion where you're not supposed to even talk to me if you want your own field. Just take it, just namespace it properly, right? I'm not, in, I'm not interested in being like this, this person in the middle who manages everybody's fields. That's explicitly not what I want. Just pick a field you want, namespace it properly by just using a name that's <coughs> unlikely to collide with everybody else's, and then add whatever you like. It's supposed to be distributed like Linux's, right? So, uh, yeah. Talk about uh, security. Is there a stretch model for uh, on D? Because uh, for me, it resembles uh, finger D. I think it, well, it resembles what? It resembles uh, finger D. Finger D? Yeah. Uh, okay. Would, uh, give uh, access uh, to uh, to the own directories. Uh, so uh, the, the I don't really sure if they understand the question, but uh, if we did this rat model of this kind of stuff um, uh, and. Uh, and uh, uh, because it resembles finger D, I don't understand why this would finger resemble. Finger would give uh, access to uh, the people to uh, the Larum, uh, dot project to show uh, which projects uh, you have and it was a uh, flow uh, with uh, that design. Uh, I mean, I know what finger is, but I don't see the relation to this. You know, finger is not a, about user records and it's not about, like, I mean, again, like this stuff is, like, if we if we put it in the home directory, that stuff is encrypted, right? Like, we don't leak information. Unless you're logged in, nobody gets access to this. And this stuff is, so it's actually only accessible to people who have access to the system. They can query the user database because that's how Unix always worked, right? But at that point, you also already have to have access to the local system. So I don't know. If you want to implement something like FingerD on top of this, you can use this st stuff. But um, I don't see the relationship to FingerD at all, I must say. Because it gives you access to... I don't see that. I'm sorry. <laughs> so how do I share a file between two users? Uh, so the question was regarding how do I share files between two users. Um, uh, well, you know, after both of them logged in, the users are not very distinct from traditional users, right? Like they'll both have a UID that's going to be sticky until the system goes but eventually. Then when they lock out and log in once again, you just thank the owner of each no. and every file. No, so no, 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 no. I do that when you do it on a different machine where the UID is actually different, right? Okay. We, the, so the, yeah, um, uh, uh, the, so the question regarding, like, uh, if you log out and log in again, uh, what happens to the UID? Um, uh, uh, do we actually change it so that sharing files is difficult? So, like, first of all, um, you know, if you want to give other users access to your home directory, right, knock yourself out. But uh, also... <laughs> It's maybe not the best way to share uh, files, right? Um, but uh, uh, so ultimately, like on a specific system, after you logged in once, once, uh, once you actually we copy the user record onto the system so that um, it stays pinned, and the UID uh, assignment stays pinned. So that basically means that after you logged in once on a specific system, UID is stable, guaranteed to be stable forever, 
right? We can only remove that limitation if we do the sandboxing stuff that we talked about earlier here, right? Uh, because we need to make sure that you don't get to write anywhere else. But that basically means, yeah, if you want to use ACLs or Chmod or Tone or whatever else to, to give other people access to your files, same way as it always worked. Except if you then take that home directory and move it to a different machine, because if you do that, then you get the get the the, the uh, choning done. But that also means that we'll strip all the ACLs for you, uh, because I mean we have to, because all the the user ID assignments and things like that don't make sense anymore. If you then move it back to your system, you'll get back the user ID that you had before, but you'll not get the ACLs back because we had to strip them all. So, um, but my answer is, if you subscribe to that um, traditional model, knock yourself out. But then you don't get to get the truly migratable stuff. It's one or the other, up to you. So are, are we going to have any, let's say, a default folder to separate for sharing files between users that reside in the machine and they are not encrypted or anything like that? Um, so the question, I mean, I'm, my time's over, but let's do this one last thing. Uh, the question is, like, will we have a, a shared folder where you can actually share stuff between users? I mean, uh, you can't do this. I, it's, Homely doesn't do this for you. I don't think. Like, you know, I'm pretty sure that um, in most cases, when you want to share something with other people, you probably do it via, I don't know, Telegram or, or email or something like this, because inherently it means probably most of the people you want to share stuff with, I'm not going to use your, 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 the same system. Like, at least uh, if I, when I have shared a file with somebody else in the last two years, <laughs> 20 years, they didn't have access to my local system, right? So I think the focus for sharing stuff should always be on doing it distributed, right? Meaning do it on the network and not on the local stuff. But again, write that infrastructure if you want this. Um, it's totally doable. It's totally doable already. Um, yeah. I think that's it. I don't have any further time. Thank you very much uh, for your interest, for the questions. And, um, if you have any further questions, let's do that outside. <laughs>